and with their um, hellish cry of Aera, uh, they so frightened the Germans that they ran away from them. So the Germans never learned that their rifles were empty. Okay. Now, all of these are great stories. Later, when the, uh, when the resistance uh, movement uh, was bombing uh, railroads, uh, the German railroad system, <coughs> uh, the minute the bombs went off, they would all charge out of the hills. And as the American Greek company, made up of American Greeks, actually it was a battalion of, of, of nine parties of which were uh, distributed around Greece uh, to assist the um, to insist the, uh, to assist the Andades, uh, they would charge through minefields in order to get down to the trains so that they could kill anybody who survived, of course, wiping themselves out in the process. And we have descriptions of this, and for anybody who really wants to, uh, the entire history of this uh, Greek-American brigade and many of the, much of the politics concerned with, with uh, uh, establishing it were, um, uh, are all sitting in the government archives uh, in the United States. There's lots of stuff here that uh, most of the scholars who write about World War II don't even touch. And this is I mean, really great stuff. It's good for movies, uh, it's good for scholarly studies, and it's good for fiction uh, or novels uh, as well. And it just sits there. Uh, this is in NARA uh, in the CIA or uh, OSS documents uh, that, uh, that are there. And they're all open for reading and copying, photocopying, and publishing. So, I mean, do pass it on to your students. Uh, I would love to do it myself, but uh, I'm back in the 10th century, book that I'm working on, so I can't really continue in that direction uh, until I finish these other things. All right, so this is the fighting aspect, if you will, uh, of it. <coughs> now, um, The uh, final solution uh, of the Jewish problem, which um, uh, was formulated, or rather announced, was formulated already in the summer of 1941. It was formulated uh, at the Vansi Conference on January 20th, 1942. The, important, the importance of the date is that on December 31st, uh, New Year's Eve of 1942, and December 31st, 1941, uh, Abba Kovner raised the um, uh, necessity of an organized Jewish resistance against the Nazis who were planning to destroy all of the Jews. Finally came to him, uh, especially after the Nazis were butchering people uh, in, uh, uh, in Lithuania in 19, uh, during the, the, the fall of 1941, that he finally realized that this was a concerted, not, not, not separate events, but a concerted program to kill Jews. So he announced to his um, uh, scouts that, um, uh, that this is the case, and he published it later in Hebrew and in Yiddish, and he gave the rallying cry, if you will, of uh, what became the rallying cry of the Jewish resistance in Europe, uh, which was understood um, internally uh, by the uh, by the big Jews as well. And uh, what he did is he cited this very interesting phrase, "Lo nitze kitzon tevach yuval," we shall not go like sheep to the slaughter. Now. Uh, uh, my spouse um, called me up because she was working on, on, on these things from a different perspective. And she called me up very excitedly and she said, Kovner didn't invent it. I found it at the beginning of the century uh, in the Zionist uh, eulogy uh, for, uh, uh, for somebody who was killed in, 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 uh, in the Soviet Union. Uh, and uh, during the eulogy, uh, this was uttered by, um, uh, by Ben Svi the uh, uh, second president of Israel, way back then, you know, in, in somewhere around 1910, 1911. And I said, gee, that sounds familiar. What do you mean familiar? 
I read this in the book of Yossi Kwan, which I'm translating. The book of Yossi Kwan was written, or at least edited, uh, published uh, in the middle of the 10th century, and proved to be the most popular and longest narrative in an exceptionally beautiful Hebrew for the past millennium. Of course, nobody knows it today, because Josephus has been rediscovered by the Jews. So why read Yosipon, which is a um, which rehearses the whole history of the Second Temple period? Anyway, so she says, really? I said, yeah, let me go look. So I went and I looked and I looked and I looked. I said, yeah, it was uttered by, by Matityahu, the father of the, the Hasmonean clan and his five uh, sons, all, all of whom were called the Maccabees. And when he called for rebellion against the um, uh, the Syrian Macedonians uh, who were persecuting the Jews, um, he um, uttered this. The problem is that the first time it shows up is in the book of Yosipon. And what he did is he strung together two biblical verses in order to create this phrase. Okay. The Byzantines did the same thing, by the way. And uh, the Bible does it also in the book of Psalms strings together different ones in order to form new verses. She says, wow, she says, that's incredible. And uh, a couple of years ago, uh, she had a, a, a grant from Yad Vashem uh, to study this Tzom uh, in, uh, L'Tav in Hebrew literature and found out that it was ubiquitous in, um, uh, in the East, German, East, East European press in Hebrew. Not only the biblical verses that it was taken from, or, or, or that it conjoined together, but um, uh, also uh, based upon the early um, uh, Sidurim prayer books that uh, were in circulation during the Middle Ages. So in effect, what we have here is this unique phrase of the, that first appears in this 10th century copy, uh, that becomes the rallying cry of Jewish resistance during World War II. I it. Anyway, this was a major finding uh, on her part uh, and, and shocked all of her friends who had written books on Abba Kovna and who had studied the literature of World War II. Wow! But that's what happens when historians or people who are historically oriented you know, read sources. You find out things that uh, People who live in a world of mythology or contemporary journalism have no idea that there is a, an, an ancestry to this. And by the way, the, uh, the book of Yossi Point influenced the, the Jewish martyrs of the, of the First Crusade and showed up continuously all through uh, the, um, uh, the uh, unglorious history of Jewish martyrdom uh, during the past millennium. All right, anyway, so um, uh, why do I mention all of this? on the fact that it's a great story, uh, is that the, um, uh, the Greek Jews, <coughs> that is the Sephardic Jews of, of Salonika, uh, and the uh, Romania Jews of, uh, of the south, and of the, basically of the Italian zone, uh, at least of the, the western Epirot uh, uh, cities such as Yanina uh, and Patras and, uh, um, uh, and Athens and, and Crete and, and, uh, and the list. Uh, were all subject to Greek nationalist uh, history teaching, which is basically blood and guts. Because okay? Greece, uh, as, as one philosopher wrote uh, about the Greeks, is the only heroes are dead heroes. And Greeks love their dead heroes. Right? They used to create temples to them. If you go to Pestum in, in, in southern Italy, which is just south of Salerno Beach, uh, where the Americans landed uh, and, uh, when they invaded Italy, uh, you'll see all these gorgeous Greek temples, best Greek temples extant. And under every one of them, there's a Greek hero. Like a little section that's where the hero is. Who these heroes are, we don't know. But uh, they were all there. In other words, the foundation stone of these temples was the grave of a hero, which probably would led him to bring this idea that all heroes are dead heroes. In any event, uh, so what did they learn? They learned all of the nationalist history uh, of, the, um, uh, of the modern period uh, and how Greek heroes uh, fought and died against the, um, first against the Turks 
uh, then against the Bulgarians, uh, and onward and onward. In other words, this was the, the history, if you will, the military history that was part of the nationalist uh, inculcation uh, amongst, the, uh, amongst the youth. Uh, and of course, this was introduced to the Jews, who knew nothing about this stuff because they had their own dead heroes. You know, in Sefer Yosipon and uh, martyrs uh, in the Talmud, and the whole litany of, 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 of these things which were coming to the fore. Um, so these two traditions, if you will, uh, became part of the uh, educational experience that ultimately was translated uh, into the, uh, the battlefield. And, uh, you know, when the officers said charge, they charged, just like non-Jewish Greeks, and died, just like non-Jewish Greeks. Uh, and the number of them, uh, uh, the number of dead uh, was highly praised by um, uh, the, uh, the Greek uh, Prime Minister uh, uh, Solago, uh, how do you pronounce his name? Solo, Solokoglu, the first Greek Prime Minister under the occupation, uh, when he was general of the army, um, uh, praised the Jews. And Yonis Metaxas, who was the Prime Minister at the time, praised the Jews. And the um, highest praise was given to uh, uh, Major um, uh, Mordechai Frizis, uh, from Chalkis, uh, who um, later was posthumously um, uh, promoted uh, to colonel. And uh, streets were named after him all over Greece. Uh, and the statue was put up for him in, for him in, in Chalkis. Uh, and uh, his daughter would talk about later, not his daughter, his niece, talk about a little bit later, but he was the highest ranking officer to be killed uh, in pushing back the Italians uh, out of um, uh, northern Greece. And he and four uh, Greek Jews from uh, uh, Larissa uh, were machine gunned by an Italian plane and, and killed uh, just in the they were pushing, pushing him back. Uh, and that, in effect, broke the Italian attack uh, and therefore made him into a national Hero. Now, uh, so uh, many of these uh, uh, many of these Jews who had experience as uh, fighters during the war in the Albanian campaign, uh, and thanks to a, uh, a Jewish doctor, uh, uh, many of the, uh, uh, the Greek soldiers who came in with frostbite did not get their legs uh, amputated since the Greeks had a propensity for treating frostbite that way. Uh, and he realized that there were more intelligent ways of treating frostbite. Uh, and he eventually became a hero in the resistance as head of the medical officer. And then he became, uh, uh, if you will, a major uh, medical officer in the, uh, uh, in the Greek army. Uh, and. Uh, he had been sent to the concentration camp, and he was given medals by the, um, uh, the Queen of uh, the Netherlands for saving uh, uh, slaves uh, who otherwise would have died. So um, uh, this, was, this was his contribution, if you will, uh, during the, the fighting period. And then, of course, it continued all the way through, as many young Jewish doctors and medical students uh, who were in the mountains uh, served in the various uh, uh, field hospitals that was set up to deal with the, uh, the wounded and Dalte's, whether from uh, disease or frostbite uh, or, or uh, uh, firing wounds that they, uh, that they experienced, or by accidentally stepping on mines or grenades, uh, which both Jews and, and, and non-Jews did, uh, since they didn't quite realize the dangers of it, uh, that you should look. But then British officers also stepped on mines and blew themselves up. So uh, I mean, war is held, as Sherman said, uh, sometimes uh, survival is held, uh, as we're beginning to realize with the, uh, the stories of our own veterans. All right, so anyway, that's, that's, that's from the wartime perspective. <clears throat> now, um, the, uh, after, after the Wannsee Conference, then, the schedule was, was, was uh, established to, uh, of how to get rid of all of the Jews. Uh, it turned out that it was um, a sort of a waste of effort uh, to, um, to shoot them, uh, as most of the Jews of uh, uh, the Soviet Union that was overrun uh, were shot. Uh, 
uh, and it was also debilitating for the soldiers, you know, they were drunk all the time, they were shooting them, uh, they eventually went mad. Some of them, some of others enjoyed it, you know, and then, then, then what do you do with them when you, you release them from the army? So, uh, so the bullets, it was also expensive, you know, to continue to manufacture bullets. Uh, so they invented um, gas trucks in Yugoslavia. And for those of you who saw the movie, The Vansi Conference, which would be an interesting thing to make available for, for the people here, um, uh, which in effect reenacts the Vansi Conference with a lot of explanatory material anachronistically put into it, but it gives you a general idea of this corporate um, governmental um, assembly uh, or luncheon that took, uh, that took 90 minutes uh, in which they, they plan to officially include the government into the destruction of the Jewish communities of Europe. So, 90 minutes, the whole thing, very effectively taken care of uh, and, uh, and implemented. So, so they decided to use um, uh, gas trucks and to load up the people in the gas trucks and smother them with um, uh, carbon monoxide. Now, um, they didn't, uh, they started in Yugoslavia, uh, and it was mostly women and children that were killed in the gas trucks. Why no men? Because all the men, and Jewish men in Yugoslavia, had been drafted into the Wehrmacht ammunition factories, which were put up on the front lines all over Eastern Europe. So the ones in uh, uh, Yugoslavia were filled with, well, all of them were filled with, many of them were filled mostly with uh, Jewish males and sometimes females. So what happened was that um, uh, Hitler instituted an order uh, by which uh, uh, 10 people would be, uh, would be shot for every German wounded and 150 killed for every German who was killed. And uh, since the peasants, you know, peasants have common sense, which is like how we invented the term. So <laughs> when Germans, when the, when the, um, when the resistance killed uh, or attacked a uh, German unit, and people were hurt or killed. Uh, they knew that there was going to be repercussions, so they all ran away to the mountains, except for the Jews, because they were trapped. So the Wehrmacht, which couldn't find enough sacrifices for this stupid order, uh, would take the males who were in the factories. And eventually they ran out of Jews to run the factories. And peasants couldn't run the factories, and sort of that was the end of these working factories in Yugoslavia. So, uh, so the only ones who were left were the women who had been put into concentration camps with their children, and um, they're the ones uh, who suffered the, uh, that experience, the women and the old people. So that was a terrible um, fate for them. Then, of course, um, uh, in, uh, in Treblinka, in, uh, which was the, the death camp for Warsaw, um, they had to deal with um, uh, the problem if you will, of, of carbon monoxide, of killing thousands by carbon monoxide. Probably of burying the dead, and uh, it's going to be too disgusting to, to talk about. But uh, what they did is um, they had a T4 group, uh, as it was called, and the T4 group had been the ones who were making, uh, doing away with defective people and old people in Germany. Until the, uh, the German bishops announced that this was not a good thing to do and made such a public outcry that the Nazis officially stopped the T4 program. Unofficially continued, but officially they stopped it. But meanwhile, all these T4 technicians, the German officers, were out of a job. So they were sent to Treblinka to devise new ways of getting rid of lots of Jews. Uh, we won't go into the difficulties of that. But uh, eventually, uh, they developed um, uh, the gas chambers uh, that became part of the new uh, concentration camp system that was being developed. And the importance of the, uh, the story of the Jews of Salonika, aside from the grief of, of, of wiping out uh, something like 97% of, uh, of the Jewish population uh, of Salonika, 97 percent, 45,000 that were deported to, uh, uh, to Auschwitz uh, out of 55,000 that were in the city. Most of those, had, the 10,000, had gone into the mountains 
uh, or it otherwise escaped beforehand. Uh, the, um, the Salonika Jews who were sent uh, beginning in March 1943 to Auschwitz uh, were killed in Birkenau uh, in these gas chambers. And they were the first entire community that was sent in this um, new uh, mechanized uh, factory uh, for death, as it was called. Uh, the Dutch went along with them, but, but less Dutch were, were, were deported and killed than uh, the Salonika Jews. So they were the beginning, if you will, of the mass destruction by this uh, uh, highly sophisticated means. And that was their tragedy that all of them were killed, uh, well, not all of them, most of them were killed uh, from May through uh, June uh, 19, uh, 1943. Uh, the second group, um, that is the Jews of the Italian zone, could not be deported or even persecuted uh, because the Italians basically hated the Germans. Uh, and they refused to let the Gestapo work in Athens. Absolutely refused. Uh, when the Italians uh, overthrew Mussolini, and eventually, of course, you know that the, he was caught and hung upside down with his mistress and basically uh, uh, desecrated by, uh, by the Italians in anger because he lost the war. Not because of the war, because they lost the war. Um, the um, uh, General Bedolio uh, took, um, uh, negotiated a surrender and a switching of sides so that uh, uh, Italy became our uh, ally from that point on. Then um, the Germans had already planned, they knew this was coming, uh, so in September they took over the Italian zone. And in uh, September, Rosh Hashanah in September, because the Germans always like to do things, and the Italians also like to do things on holidays uh, to insult the people that they uh, hated or conquered, uh, uh, sent out a, uh, an order in the papers for the Jews to assemble in order to be deported to, uh, to the work camps in Poland. The um, chief rabbi of Athens, uh, who knew a little bit of German, was in Gestapo headquarters uh, at the time that they were discussing this. Uh, he had been called in to give lists of Jews in Athens so that they could be arrested. And Athens had at this time roughly about 10,000 Jews, many of them refugees from, uh, from Salonika. <coughs> um, actually, the, Jews of, so the rich Jews of Salonika, the middle class, uh, had left Salonika after the Germans began to persecute the, uh, the Jews there uh, and call in rich people and beat them up to get their money with the assistance of uh, uh, Armenians who had worked for Jews who decided to get some of them by turning them in. Um, and uh, uh, a group of Jews who were uh, basically the worst kind of collaborators because they went around and, and uh, both in Salonika and in Athens uh, and elsewhere later in the war of uh, uh, turning in Jews to the, uh, to the Germans. Unfortunately, they were punished after the war. The Jews demanded it. The Jews of Salonika demanded it. Uh, and if you've ever seen a, um, a mob of Greeks uh, screaming for blood, uh, then you can imagine that the, the Jews were just as bad uh, and eventually had them brought to trial. And most of them were severely punished uh, in the, uh, as a result of their actions as a result of their collaboration. So in any event, the, um, uh, all the Jews that, that were in Salonika, and not in, in Athens, the 10,000, um, were ordered to uh, present themselves to be uh, deported. So the rabbi heard this, and uh, he said, I don't have the lists, because the anti-Semites, when they raided the Jewish community center um, offices, Burnt them. White lies are legitimate under certain circumstances. <coughs> uh, so he then went home and uh, he made a call to the Jewish Council, 
because of this, the Ottoman argument that the Jewish leadership had to have a secular council so that uh, uh, there would be uh, uh, some sort of democracy within the community. Uh, and he called them up and he said, the, uh, the old man is sick. Uh, he's going to the mountains. Which uh, was totally different than uh, the situation in Salonika, where uh, Rabbi Koretz, who has a, a rotten reputation, uh, called a collaborator by the um, uh, Palestinian leadership during the war, uh, and uh, almost every survivor treats him as responsible for the murder of uh, all the Salonika Jews because of his actions during the war. I've talked about it, uh, and uh, uh, it seems that the rabbi was more naive than evil. The story of his uh, imprisonment uh, in 1941 uh, in, uh, in Vienna uh, indicates that he was totally fooled by the Gestapo uh, in, terms of the fate, in, in terms of what the fate of the Jews would be, at least in his understanding. <coughs> so in any event, um, uh, Koretz, uh, as I said, uh, uh, you know, tried to do his thing but he was a religious leader, not a political man. And uh, uh, everybody suffered accordingly. But what people tend to forget is that the majority of the Jewish population of Salonika was either very young or very old. The very young can't live by themselves. The very young. And the very old cannot slip up into the mountains. It just doesn't work. So the majority of the population was in any event trapped in the middle of the German 5th Army, which was centered in Salonika. So, I mean, they were, in effect, uh, sentenced to death, and they were in a rather porous cage, but they couldn't get out of it because of their infirmities. Anyway, so, so Rabbi Barzilai uh, then um, uh, was enticed to escape. I call it a kidnapping. Uh, other people say that uh, he was a hero. But basically what it is is the, uh, uh, the resistance uh, consisting of, of one Jew and one communist uh, went to visit him and invited him to go to the mountains. And uh, the story that I got was that uh, if he doesn't come, one rabbi more or less is not going to destroy us. So eventually, successfully, he was kidnapped with the help of uh, Archbishop Damaskinos, who supplied a car that took him uh, to the outskirts, and eventually uh, they put him on a, a donkey and took him up to the hills where uh, uh, he survived in, in one of the uh, Andati centers. <clears throat> All right. Um, so the Jews of the Italian zone. Uh, who didn't appear in uh, uh, September of 1943, uh, were called up again in uh, Passover of 1944. And of the 10,000 who were in the city, uh, most of them escaped either to the mountains with the aid of uh, uh, the Greek resistance, semi-organized by, uh, uh, by the Greek resistance, uh, in which there were a considerable number of Jews in the leadership as well. Uh, and uh, the majority of the rest disappeared into the so-called red zones of, uh, in other words, the communist areas or the sympathetic uh, communist areas uh, of Athens. And some people just disappeared. Um, some 800 uh, Jewish males went to, not 800, the, 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 some Jewish males went to the synagogue on Passover because they were going to give up the salt. Uh, the, uh, you know, the wafers that, uh, not the wafers, the, uh, <coughs> the unleavened bread that was eaten at Passover. And uh, they were arrested. They were told to send for their families. And ultimately, 800 Jews uh, were shipped out as part, of the, uh, as part of the convoy. And added to the other Jews of the Italian zone, who were sent out uh, on this uh, train, if you will, uh, on the spring of 1944, and the majority of them were killed on arrival. Usually, 85% uh, of the uh, 
uh, of the Jews were killed on arrival, sometimes up to 90% because of the, uh, the amount of malaria uh, and typhus that uh, they brought with them. Uh, simply because, well, malaria definitely because it was ubiquitous in northern Greece, uh, and uh, typhus because of the sanitary conditions. Uh, so they were just in the prophylactic uh, destruction. They were just made to go away. Uh, and about 10% or maybe as many as 15% were uh, entered into the camp as slave workers. <clears throat> now, um, so that's basically the destruction. The last, the last communities on the outskirts, like Yanina, um, uh, uh, or the islands of um, uh, Rhodes and, and, uh, and Kos, uh, or the, uh, the community on uh, uh, Crete, which is a strange story because they were put on a boat with Italian prisoners of war that the Germans had taken, uh, and uh, uh, Greek, uh, uh, Greek uh, uh, political criminals, uh, and the boat was uh, sunk on the way. There's a big controversy over who sank the boat. And uh, a colleague of mine who was very much in the mood of, of Crete uh, did all the research and came to the conclusion that uh, it was the British submarine that sank them. So more blood on the British head <coughs> during World War II, but they didn't care. They had other problems, including whole fleets uh, of men that were sunk by, by German ships or by their own during the terrible sea battles that took place during the war. Uh, so that's the sad destruction, if you will, of Greek Jewry. Uh, after the war, about uh, 10,000 came out of the hills, uh, and about 2,000 returned from the camps. And uh, the majority of those left in 1945 uh, to, uh, to Israel uh, on the uh, Aliyah Beit, uh, as well as actually the last legitimate emigration. Uh, uh, boat uh, left from Greece, and then the rest of them snuck out uh, later on. Um, and so the, and, and, and the, the remaining uh, numbers above, above 5,000 left Greece after the great earthquake uh, in the early 1950s, uh, which pretty much destroyed many of the Ionian islands. So that was the last great migration. And the population has roughly stabilized at somewhere around uh, 5,000. I think it's now about four uh, since, uh, since that period, with the young people going to Israel or the United States or, or England or, uh, or France or Belgium uh, to join uh, uh, relatives. Um, and it's mainly stabilized there with a slowly aging population with all of the problems that that entails. Now, inside the camps, <coughs> Uh, the uh, so 